When Balaam saw that it pleased the Lord to bless Israel, he did not go, as at other times, to look for omens, but set his face toward the wilderness. And Balaam lifted up his eyes and saw Israel camping tribe by tribe. And the Spirit of God came upon him, and he took up his discourse and said, The oracle of Balaam, the son of Beor, the oracle of the man whose eye is open." The oracle of him who hears the words of God, who sees the vision of the Almighty, falling down with his eyes uncovered. How lovely are your tents, O Jacob, your encampments, O Israel, like palm groves that stretch afar, like gardens beside a river, like aloes that the Lord has planted, like cedar trees beside the waters. Water shall flow from his buckets, and his seed shall be in many waters. His king shall be higher than Agag, and his kingdom shall be exalted. God brings him out of Egypt, and is for him like the horns of the wild ox. He shall eat up the nations, his adversaries, and shall break their bones in pieces, and pierce them through with his arrows. He crouched, he lay down like a lion, and like a lioness. Who will rouse him up? Blessed are those who bless you, and cursed are those who curse you. And Balak's anger was kindled against Balaam, and he struck his hands together. And Balak said to Balaam, I called you to curse my enemies, and behold, you've blessed them these three times. Therefore now flee to your own place. I said, I will certainly honor you, but the Lord has held you back from honor. And Balaam said to Balak, Did I not tell your messengers whom you sent to me? If Balak should give me his house full of silver and gold, I would not be able to go beyond the word of the Lord to do either good or bad of my own will. What the Lord speaks, that will I speak. Thus ends the reading of God's word. In J.K. Rowling's Harry Potter series, The story begins with an attempted murder. A wicked wizard attempts to kill an infant Harry Potter, but ends up almost killing himself. So how was this accomplished killer thwarted? A counter curse. The killing curse, Avra Kedavra, is from an old Aramaic meaning, saying, meaning, I destroy as I speak. And the counter curse is simply love. The love of a mother cradling her baby despite the threat of death. Harry's mother mouths no words uh, for a spell save a scream. And the killing curse, which was thought to be unstoppable, was countered by love. Now this is all a pretend fictional story, but I bring this up because in the biblical story, we have an example of a king attempting to put a killing curse on God's people, yet he is thwarted by God's fatherly love for his child, Israel. God's love is the effective counter-curse. And what is the true opposite of a curse? A blessing. And that's what ends up happening repeatedly in the Balaam narrative in Numbers. Balaam stands up to prophesy a curse, but God's word supplies a blessing instead. And so the wonderful news for God's people is that even when powerful pagans intend to hurt God's people, the Lord can sovereignly intercede to turn even an adversarial attack into a blessing. But the main point I'd like to draw your attention to today is that since God blesses his people, our appropriate response is to bask in his blessing. God's people are blessed as they bask in his salvation. What does it mean to bask? It means to stay and soak it in. Like a lizard in the sun, you bask. Uh, in something by staying in it for as long as possible, by not doing anything that would jeopardize your happy position. If you find a good thing, stick with it, stay there. You endanger your charmed basking situation by always moving for more. 
And notice the blessings that God is blessing his people with and be content. You see, the world, the flesh, and the devil do not have any power to take blessing away from you, but you have the sad capability to move on from your blessed situation into an estate of sinful indulgence that will leave you unsatisfied and fruitless. The Israelites have been blessed, just been blessed by Balaam twice previous to this blessing in 24. And Balaam surprisingly says in 23, 21, that he has not beheld misfortune in Jacob. And Balaam declares that there is no enchantment or divination against Israel. But after both blessings of 24, Numbers 25 begins with these sad words. While Israel lived in Shittim, the people began to whore with the daughters of Moab. They should have basked in blessing instead. Here's why. Life with God is lush. It's lush. Notice how green and bountiful are the words of Balaam's oracle. Palm groves, gardens beside a river, Aloes and cedars beside waters, verse 6. Palms are uh, those especially precious trees of the sands. They provide shade at desert oases. They often provide coconuts for eating and for drinking. According to Wikipedia, there are 2,600 species of palm. In the Middle East, they are symbols of life, fertility, and victory. But to the naked eye, they're just obvious green trees in a dry and weary land. And a garden beside a river. Thus is Israel. And it sends our minds back to Eden, watered by four rivers. Or the hanging gardens of Babylon, watered by the Tigris and Euphrates rivers. Or Revelation itself, where a river flows through the center and dotted by trees whose leaves are for the healing of the nations. This is the picture of God's people as they dwell with him. Aloes. Aloes the Lord has planted. Aloes are not only full of life in desert places, they are used to this day as a natural lotion and balm for dry skin or burnt skin. Green, lush, pleasant blessing. Cedars. Cedars beside the water. Cedars are evergreens known for their odiferous wood, which is resistant to both rot and moth. And to this day, people use cedar wood in their closets to fend off moths, which might otherwise eat their textiles. These are all pictures of God's people as they dwell in his blessing. Cedar, it's an evergreen tree. It reminds us of that picture in Psalm 1 of a tree planted by a stream whose leaf does not wither. In Balaam's oracle, these metaphors are used symbolically to describe God's people, yet these word pictures only describe God's people as God's people remain united to the source of their life, the Lord God himself. And if it is veiled here, it is explicit in Jesus' teaching in his last earthly recorded speech to his disciples before his death and resurrection. In John 15, he says, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you abide in me, you will bear much fruit. John 15, 9, as the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. You see, life with God is lush, but only if we abide in him. We should expect no rich green life apart from him. Sure, sometimes even Christians abiding in Christ, we are pruned, we go through dry seasons, but even this is for our strengthening and cherishing. Uh, Strengthening so that we would cherish no earthly thing, but more and more unite ourselves to Christ alone. Life in God is good. It is simple. It is common. In some ways, it is obvious. And such a life is boring and unsatisfying to those without God, yet to those abiding in Christ, it is rich. Let us therefore lust for nothing more. Life with God is lasting. 
I believe that this is what verse 7 alludes to. The seed of Israel shall be in many waters. That doesn't mean he's watered down or he's sleeping around, but rather it means that his influence will be spread far. His investments will be diversified and with a broad habitat, no local blight will wipe him out. And this botanical phenomenon is a metaphor for a corporate life with God. The influence of God's people is long-lasting, culture-changing, world-ranging, but only in so much as God's people bask in his blessing, abiding in him, as Jesus says. Now, there are some fools on the internet these days who, with technological advances, seek everlasting life here on earth. But in so doing, they war against the very fabric of the moral universe which says that the wages of sin is death. But if our life is hid with Christ on high, whether a God-fearing Jew in the Old Testament or a New Testament Christ follower, then we can lay hold of everlasting life now. And even as a seed spreads on the waters and is buried in the earth to rise to new life, so too the believer can walk through the waters of death and his body be lowered to the grave, yet he will rise again to new life with an imperishable body by the power of that great gospel entrusted to us in God's word. Therefore, let us bask in his blessing. We don't need to scramble and fight and covet to scrape out a slightly longer life on this earth. Now, we should treat our bodies as temples of the Lord and be good stewards of each day, yet we bask in his blessing, knowing that if we die, it is merely the beginning of an eternally lasting life with God in Christ. Let us, therefore, rest easy and not waste our lives in worthless gain, Let us delight in the wife of our youth, the work of our hands, the food and drink he daily provides as we dwell in him. So what would it mean for God's people back then to bask in his presence? It would mean bringing him offerings in his temple. What does it mean today to bask in his presence? It means to live your life as a living sacrifice holy and pleasing to the Lord. This is your spiritual act of worship according to Romans 12, 1 and 2. Bask in him because God's kingdom is as high as heaven. In what may be one of the most understated truths of Scripture, Balaam boasts, Israel's king will be higher than Agag. No kidding. The only reason anyone even remembers Agag's name is because of the Bible, and Jesus' kingdom has existed for about as long as Agag had otherwise been forgotten. Who's Agag? Agag is the king of the Amalekites at the time of Saul, but due to this reference here and the reference to Haman as an Agagite in the book of Esther, commentators theorize that Agag might be like a royal title akin to Abimelech for the Philistines or Pharaoh for the Egyptians. Regardless... It's indeed prophetic that Balaam speaks of a king when Israel's only king was the Lord. Now, Israel will have a human king like the nations in Saul, and then they'll have a king after God's own heart in David, with whom the Lord will make an everlasting covenant in 2 Samuel 7. So this is true. God's kingdom is higher. And by God's revelation to Balaam, he can see that Israel's king will be exalted, lifted high. He's right, but he has no idea how right he is. No name will be so well known or regarded in all the earth as the name of King Jesus. And though he looked like a peripatetic philosopher while he walked this earth, he proclaimed that the kingdom of God was at hand. It was his kingdom. And after he had slain death and hell, he rose from the grave, ascended to his throne in heaven, and no kingdom has ever been so exalted. And this makes basking in his presence all that easier. Like a high sun is our son, King Jesus. All other earthly kings have only risen so far, and some of those whose kingdoms spread the farthest reign the least. And if we ever get a good earthly ruler, we'd long for him or her to rule long. And we'd be anxious about what would happen when they fell. Not so King Jesus. 
His kingdom is founded in heaven. It cannot be torn down. And so for those of you who have bowed the knee to this king, rest easy, knowing that his reign now lasts forever and rules over everything. So the key to basking is not moving, is resting, contenting in what he has already done. So then, do God's people ever move? Yes. His might enables our movements. His might enables our movements. Numbers 24, 8. God brings him out of Egypt and is for him like the horns of the wild ox. He shall eat up the nations, his adversaries, and shall break their bones in pieces. We move when he moves. Israel, weaponless, indentured sheep herders, took out four score of Egypt's finest war machines. Then they took out the Amalekites, then Arad, then the Amorites, on their way to take out the Canaanites. Well... The Lord did. And they followed. He makes a way for us. His strength provides movement for his people. And if it did then, why should it not provide for his people now? It doesn't matter if we're marching with an army or running away with a sword in our pack. The Lord protects his new covenant people. And his love which protects us from cursing, protects us from killing too. He provides for his people, even if that provision lies across the waters of death. His might enabled the Israelites to cross over the Red Sea, to cross over the Jordan. His might enables his people to cross through the dark valley, though the waves are high, the temperature cold, and the outlook bleak. His might enables our movements. In my house, I have several lizards. Well, they're not lizards, actually. They're people who act like lizards. And they treat sunny spots like lizards do. Wherever the sun is shining, that's where my wife and the other lizards will be, doing their work. And so since the angle changes throughout the day, my wife's happy spot for basking changes too. And it's a picture of what our basking in God's blessing should look like. If he moves, we move. If he's providing blessing in a slightly different place, no problem. We just adjust. The prophecy ends with this prophecy about a lion. Well, Christ is the lion and the lamb. It says here, he crouched, he lay down like a lion. Who's Balaam talking about? Israel or the Lord God? Well, lions seem to be an ongoing theme for Balaam. He mentioned them in a previous prophecy, but there the lions did not rest until they had taken their prey. Here they will not be moved from their rest by anything. They are the alpha predator of the savannah. In either case, Israel is an extension of the Lord who is the true warrior as we've just seen. And if You're not an all lion or an ox, but you're protected by the strength of a lion or an ox. You function very much like a lion or an ox. You go where you want, you lay down where you want, you get up when you want. And at this point in Numbers, Israel is not moving. And Balaam is gazing down on this mighty camp from the mountain, and he realizes that this camp is not going to be scared off by any show of force from the Moabites because the Israelites have the Lord in their camp. He is Alpha. And so we can see from this story of Exodus, Leviticus, and Numbers that the Lord is a mighty warrior, like a lion. Um, But as a lion, uh, who can move him? But the lion of Judah comes also as a baby who only moved as others moved him. And his end was the cross where his disciples moved his inner body from Golgotha to the grave. In the New Testament, we learn that not only is he the lion, he is also the lamb. The Lord strongly saves his people by becoming weak and taking the place of the sacrifice in order that his people might be saved. The Lord is your strength, but he's also your salvation. What a blessing it is to be found in him. Therefore, don't seek your strength and salvation anywhere else, not in wealth, not in your own prowess. Rest in his blessing and strength such that you sense his goodness in every way. 
bask in his blessing as you would bask in the rays of a tropical sun and let his light produce life in you and long-lasting life at that. Let's pray.